go, let's take our Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 tonight. First Corinthians chapter 9, we'll be in verses 24 through 27. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, looking at verses 24 through 27. The Bible says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others... I myself should be a castaway. And let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we do thank you again for the day that you've given us. Father, we do ask that you would guide us through this evening. We ask that you would bless your word. Father, as the Holy Spirit takes it into our hearts, I pray, Father, that our hearts would be pierced by the truth of your word, that we'd be guided. Holy Spirit was given to us not only to be a comforter, but to be a teacher and a guide. And Father, we ask that you would guide us, Lord, this evening according to your will. I know it's a very familiar set of verses that we're looking at tonight, a very familiar passage in Scripture about running a race, but Lord, would you speak to our hearts afresh and anew of the things that, Lord, that you have for us tonight, things that are important for us, uh, things that will help us in our spiritual battles, things that will help us uh, to finish the course that you have laid before us, uh, obviously always looking at Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, but Lord, help us to have a desire to run the race that you have set before us and have a desire uh, to lift you up in our life uh, as we run the race that you have put us in. Father, on all of it, we want it to bring honor and glory to you, so we ask that you would help us to do that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, these are very familiar verses that we're looking at tonight. Uh, just the fact that Paul talks about the life that we're living is a race that God has put us in, and he compares that to the day that uh, that they were living in. I mean, they had their uh, Olympic Games back in that day that people would run these races and they would uh, obtain that corruptible crown uh, that they thought were so important. It would show their achievement, show uh, their determination to run the race and to win the race. But the most important race that you and I will ever be in is the race that God has placed us in, the Christian race. And we have an author that we look to uh, who's the author and finisher of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. He is also our coach. He is, an, he is our encourager, and he is our help and our strength that helps us along the way. And tonight, I just want to look at spiritual discipline, <clears throat> spiritual discipline tonight that will help us uh, in our day-to-day -day life, that will help us to finish our course faithfully because we are relying upon the one who is always faithful uh, to us, the one that helps us to finish this race. Now, you know, there are certain times in any given race that you have cheaters. You have those that want to win the race, and the only way they can win is not to do it the right way. But we have an adversary that acts like that. He could care less about winning the race. He knows he's already defeated. He knows that his path leads him to the lake of fire. So he wants to help keep other Christians from finishing their race well. He wants to make it hard. He wants to get them off track. He wants, he wants to help them think about taking shortcuts, that there's never a shortcut in the race that God has set before us because the shortcuts, the rabbit trails, always lead away from God's will and away from God's path. So tonight I want us to think about having spiritual discipline, and that means putting God first and putting the race first that he has set before us because there's a purpose to the race that God has put us in. God has put us in this race, as Paul calls it, for a purpose. And I want you to think about the purpose of discipline for a runner. Look at verse 24. Verse 24, Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain 
there's a purpose to having discipline as a runner, and that is to run a race and to obtain the prize. For you and me as Christians, we have that spiritual discipline that we do want to run the race that God has set before us. Because why would God even put us in a race? Why would God even save us and then give us a life he wants us to live, a path that he wants us to follow, other than there are things he wants to do in our life, uh, there are things he wants to show us, there are, there are victories that he wants us to have, and through it all, glorifying him. So the purpose of discipline is to run the race that has been set before us. Take your Bibles and look at Hebrews chapter 12. And while you're turning there, I want you just to think about the, uh, just the truth of a purpose. Purpose is an intention. And our purpose is what drives us to make the choices that we make in life. And our lives are always shaped by the purpose and by the decisions that we make. Paul, I believe, being the writer of Hebrews, says in verse number 1 of chapter 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I know I've, I've talked on this verse before, and you know there's sometimes things in our life isn't necessarily sin, but it's a weight that's holding us back from moving forward in our walk with the Lord. And again, the devil, if he can't get you to purposely sin against God, he at least wants to try to get us to have weights in our life that holds us back from running the race that God has set before us because it's a race that God not only wants us to run, but he wants to run with us. Uh, he wants to be there along our side as we run this race. And there are many weights in this world that can cause believers and Christians to kind of slow down and not be faithful in the race that God has set before them, not be faithful in their walk to the Lord. And I know I mentioned a few things this morning that, uh, you know what, I'm not going to debate the Bible with any, anybody. I know that God's given us his word. I know that God's word changes lives and, and God leads us through his word and God gives us wisdom so you know what, I'm not going to spend my time debating with someone who, is, who doesn't believe and just wants to pick a fight. Uh, the devil doesn't care what you believe as long as he can get you and me off track and get us off balance. He will do anything he can to get us off track. The most important thing that you and I can do as believers is to focus on Jesus Christ, to focus on what his purpose is for our life, what is it that he wants me to do? And what he wants us to do is to follow him. He says it over and over again in the scriptures to many that he comes to, follow me. So the purpose of discipline, disciplining ourselves for the race that God has us in, is to run the race and to let God show us things that may be hindering us, things that are you know, really trivial, they, they're not even important to the race that you're running but we want God to show us what it is that he wants us to do look at Philippians chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 because as the devil is a deceiver he's going to use smoke and mirrors he's going to use deception to try to get God's people, again, off course, off focus, tangled up in things that do not really matter, that will not benefit us spiritually, will not benefit our relationship with the Lord. Again, things, bad things happen in life, and everyone has the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And a lot of people quit the race because they don't, understand they want an answer from God but God does not God does not have to give us an answer to every question that we have you read through scripture and many times God just you think about you think about the life of Job Job had a race to run he had a life to live and in that life he was living he feared God he eschewed evil. 
Uh, he prayed, he was faithful to God, but something happened in his life and over a process of time, he started questioning why he was even alive. He started questioning, you know what, it would have been better if I would have never been born because then I wouldn't be going through this difficulty. And he got to a place where he was complaining to God and God had to set him straight. God had to let him know that, look, what I do is none of your business. And that's kind of putting it bluntly because, you know what, God does not have to answer to our questions. God is God and we are created to have fellowship with God. Now, yes, we do want answers and we do want God to tell us, you know, why he's allowing certain things in our life. But we already know that Romans 8.28 is true. God uses everything in our life for good because we love him. We want to lift him up in our life. God understands the struggles. He understands the spiritual battles that we face at different times. But he still wants us to be disciplined that we know that, you know what, he knows what's best. He knows what's best. Again, when you're thinking about the analogy of a race, every athlete has a coach. Every athlete has some coach that, that's hard on them, that forces them to do the exercises even after they're tired. And God stretches our faith because God understands that we are in a spiritual race. We're in a spiritual battle. I mean, again, a race or a battle. Our life is a life that God's given us to run for him, to fight for him, to bring honor and glory to him. And God wants to bestow blessings upon his people, but we have to have spiritual discipline so we can finish this race that God has put us in so we will continue to follow him faithfully, trusting him faithfully, and not allow ourselves to get hung up on petty things that do not amount to anything eternal, eternally. When you look at Philippians chapter 3, you look at verse 7 and 8. Paul says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ." I mean, Paul understands. He knows what it's like to lose things. He knows what it's like to choose to not have things so that he can have Christ. Notice what he says. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Again, the things he gained in his life, he counted loss. He said, you know what? What's more important is Jesus Christ in my life. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Paul understood that Christ had to be his focus if he was going to finish his race, if he was going to remain faithful to the Lord, if he was going to continue trusting the Lord, even sitting in prison. He was going to have to be focused on the Lord and know that, okay, this is the race that God wants me to be in, and everybody's race is different. We're all in a race, but my race is different than your race. There's things that I face that you'll never face and vice versa. We may have some similarities and there may be times again where we do face the same difficulties, the same challenges in our race, because that's the great thing about being in an encouragement with somebody else is, you know what? We always want someone who understands understands what we're going through, understands what we're facing, and maybe someone who's already uh, past this point in the race and can give some tips and give some pointers on, hey, how do I get past this? But not only do we need to run this race and be disciplined that, okay, I'm in a race. I want to be faithful in the race. I want to faithfully complete the race that God has designed for me so that I can obtain the goal that God has set before me. Look again at verse 24. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize. Now, obviously, he's speaking about the earthly races. But every child of God, every born-again believer, 
we're all running for that same prize, and we know one day we'll meet him face to face. But what Paul talks about, so run that you may obtain, he's talking about Christ. And that's the goal that we're running for. Every man striveth, he says in verse 25, every man striveth for the mastery, uh, is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I mean, as we read scripture, we know that one day we're going to receive crowns. We're going to receive rewards for the life we've lived for Christ. And obviously we receive those rewards, those crowns, so we can cast them back at the feet of the one who's worthy of all honor, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about this goal that we are to obtain, that we're running for, and it being Jesus Christ, some may ask, well, wait a minute, why am I running to win Christ? I thought I already had Christ at the moment of salvation. And that is true. But look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 teaches us some truths that we need to hold on to. Because again, if I, if I can just use marriage as an example. My marriage, just as, as I think about it, because our relationship with Christ is like a marriage. When two people come and stand before God to get married, it's a picture of Christ and the bride. And the Bible talks about we're the bride of Christ. Believers are the bride of Christ. And one day we're going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But I saw my wife in 1989 sitting in a biology class, and I was awestruck. No puppy love. I was in love. She didn't even know I existed. In fact, she used me. She used me to make another boy jealous. But she has told me, though, and I know she's told others, that when, when she came to use me, and I say that, she, she wouldn't say she used me, but anyway, she, did, she, she came over to talk to me, and she said she looked into my blue eyes, and she was awestruck. It was over. She didn't care about any other boy. I was the one. And we were 15. And now we're, I'm in my late 40s. What I'm saying is that I was, a, I, was, I was drawn to her. We became a couple. But I've worked on that relationship over these years. We've been married since 1993. But you know what? I haven't stopped trying to obtain that prize. I've got it. I have the wife, I have the family, but I haven't stopped trying to win her affection and love. Again, think about your relationship with Christ. You have salvation. He's never going to leave you, right? He's never going to leave you, he's never going to forsake you, so why do I need to try to win him? Because God said something in Romans chapter 8 that God has a desire for every one of us and that is to be like Christ. That is to become more Christ-like. But notice if you're in Philippians chapter 3 what Paul says about winning Christ, about Jesus being the goal. In Philippians 3, you look at verses 8 through 10. What Paul says as he writes to the believers at Philippi, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So the things that Paul talks about in these verses about winning Christ. Again, at the end of verse 8, he says, I may win Christ. 
And again, that kind of sounds puzzling and kind of, well, wait a minute. Again, why do I need to win Christ if he's already my Savior? Again, Paul says he wants to be found in him. He wants to be found abiding in Christ, never walking away from the Lord. Now, Christ is in us, but we still have to work on abiding in him, which means we have to work on getting closer to him. Paul said to even know his sufferings, to know him and the sufferings. Again, I'm, I'm not a personal fan of suffering. I like everything to be fine. Uh, I don't want to have to suffer anything. If I knew that there was going to be a problem, I would avoid it at all costs, right? None of us like sufferings, but when Paul says, you know, to know the sufferings of Christ, it is to have that type of faith, that, that resolve, that desire, that determination, that peace on the inside, just as Christ had, because Christ looked past what, what he was going to go through. He looked past the cross where he would sit back down at the right hand of the Father. He knew that his suffering would be beneficial for us, and we know that anything that God does in our life that we don't like, it is good for us. And to get to know the peace of Christ more in our life, to get to trust him more and to walk with him more. And Paul says, to be, that I may win Christ, be found in him, that I may know him. Again, I have Christ, but I want to know him more. I want to be found spending more time with him. I want to be found lifting him up more in my life, like John the Baptist said. When John the Baptist was tempted uh, by his disciples who came and said, hey, the one you baptized, well, he's, he's baptizing more than you. He's doing more than you. And John said, you know, I told you I wasn't the one. I told you he's the one. And, and, and John said, he must increase. And that should be our desire, that the Lord increases in our life, that we do get to know him more and we are led by him more. And Paul, I mean, that's the one thing he was focused on throughout his life was being more like Christ, meaning Christ shining forth in his life more because that was God's plan. That's God's desire for every one of us, as he says in Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among, among many brethren. The number one thing that Jesus came to do was to fulfill the will of the Father. And that should be the number one thing in all of our lives is to fulfill the will of the Father in our life. And his will is for us to run this race that he has set before us. Not only do we have to purpose to be disciplined in our spirit that, you know what, I am going to be determined to, to stay close to the Lord no matter what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be purposed in my race that my goal is always Jesus Christ because I've got him set before me. He is my focus, and he's the one that I want to win, the one I want to get closer to, the one I want to know, the one that I want to be lifted up in my life. Look back, if you would, at 1 Corinthians 9 and look at verse 25. I just want us to be reminded tonight that Jesus has to be the focus in our life. He has to be the one that we lift up. He has to be the one that, that we want. I mean, he, he has to be the one that we, we strive to get close to. And obviously, I mean, we don't, have to, we don't have to try that hard because God said that if we draw nigh unto him, he'll draw nigh unto us. I mean, it's a beautiful picture of the prodigal son who just, you know, he just turned and just headed home with that, with that repentant heart. And because he just made that first step headed home, I mean, his father saw him afar off and went to him. The fact is that God desires to fellowship with us. He desires to walk with us. He desires to help us in this race. 
I mean, I get encouragement from Paul, and I, I mention Paul a lot, and I probably read more about Paul than anybody else in the Bible because I just I see a man who who went through a lot in his life. He's in prison. He's hated by people. He's hunted. I mean, there's just people that are constantly against him, but he just continues to have a right attitude. I mean, you can't, you cannot finish a race without having a right attitude and a right focus. I mean, this, you know, I, I've told you before, but even as I think about it, I mean, I'm, I remember being in junior high and, uh, and just, you know, wanting to get out of class. So I, I went and they had this field day where you could sign up and, and uh, do, uh, you know, do races and stuff and, and different uh do different field events, and I thought, well, you know, I played soccer, so you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up for, you know, the one, the one mile race, four laps around the track. How hard can that be? I mean, I run on the soccer field back and forth, back and forth, so I mean, it can't be too hard, but you know what, after my first lap, I was dying, because at least in soccer, you can stop. You can stop for a few seconds and, and all of that, and, and I, I really wanted to give up. My second lap around, my third lap around, I'm looking across, I'm looking across the field that's in the center of the track, thinking, you know, I can just stop and just walk across and go sit down. Why well, finish? I'm last place anyway. Because there were, there were some guys that were running that, you know, they were in track and field. So, I mean, they were conditioned to run this race. And I've told you this before, and I'm so glad because it has stuck with me that there was somebody who, who was conditioned in that race. They knew how to run it. They were first. They crossed the finish line first. And he's going around, jogging around, encouraging everybody, just keep going, just keep going, finish the race. And he would come by me and he'd say, hey, you're doing good, just keep going. And I, he would even say, I know your legs are burning. My legs were burning. But he just kept encouraging me. And I saw him go to the next person. You know what? That did encourage me. That's the one thing about our Savior is when we least expect it, he comes alongside us and encourages us to keep going. Keep going. Don't give up. Because I'll admit to you, the Christian life can be hard at times. Jesus never said it would be easy, but he did say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be there. And there's many times where he does even carry us. But according to verses 25 through 27, we do have to practice this discipline so that we don't give up on what God has placed before us. He says in verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery. That means every person that enters into a contest, that every, every person that's contending with their adversaries or with uh, their competitors, every man that striver for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now again, that, you know, striver for the mastery, I mean, that, that phrase, like I said, it means to enter a contest. Well, wait a minute, I didn't choose to enter this race. No, but the Lord did put you in a race, and uh, he puts all Christians, all believers, get put into this race. Because again, God does want to change our life. He wants us to see great things that he does for us, and he doesn't want us to quit. He wants us to see that, you know what? Nothing's changed in my life as far as I have a life to live. Do you know that God knows everything that's going to come up in your life? And he knew it the moment you asked Christ to be your Savior? And he did not remove all those obstacles that you would face and will continue to face. But what he has done is he's put you in that race. You have obstacles you're going to face, but he's there to encourage you past those obstacles. He's there to help you get over those obstacles, to get around those obstacles. He doesn't want us to give up. Again, many, many do give up. 
There's, there's been many runners who have given up on the race. There have many, been many Christians who have given up on the life that God has placed before them. They've, they've stopped trusting. They lost sight of the prize, and the prize is Jesus Christ. The prize is getting closer to Jesus Christ. The prize is getting to know His peace and His strength because it is His grace that helps us to not only run the race, but to finish the race. And there's three things I want us to think about tonight that we can implement to help us to practice the discipline, the spiritual discipline, so we'll stay active in the race that God has us in. First thing I want you to think about, according to verse 25, is self-control. Notice what he says, Every man striving for the mastery is temperate in all things is temperate in all things. That's self-control. Again, when you think about, you think about a runner, you think about somebody in a race, they abstain from the distractions that would keep them from finishing that race or at least, you know, staying in that race. And you and I as Christians have to abstain from the distractions that would keep us from remaining focused on the Lord and finishing the race that he has us in. It's self-control. That's why it's important not to just fill our minds with everything. That's why it's important we don't look at everything. Movies, music, even religious material. Not all religious material is godly material. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Again, I know it's, it's, it's very simplistic, but when you think about someone who is training for a race, they watch what they eat, they take care of themselves, they get plenty enough of sleep. I mean, they're taking care of their body because they're conditioning themselves to be able to run this race and run it to the best of their ability. But unfortunately for the Christian, and I'm not saying anybody in here, I'm just saying the average Christian believes they can just take everything in and they're fine. They do not realize that scripture is true. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil communications is anything that's contrary to the truth of God. Anything that would hinder us from our spiritual growth, anything that would hinder us from having the mind of Christ, Anything it would cause us to start doubting the things of God. It all started back in the Garden of Eden. You go back and you just see where the question was just posed to them. Yea, hath God said. The only way that you and I will ever stay in the race and finish the race is if we believe every word of God. I believe every word he says about salvation. There's, there's no other way. Jesus Christ is the life. He's the truth. He's the door. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I believe that wholeheartedly. So why don't I believe everything else he says? God truly does have our best interest in mind. And he wants us to have that self-control as his people that, you know what? I don't want anything in my life that is going to hinder my race, my relationship with the Lord. And again, you go back and the Hebrews, I mean, it could be something sinful or it could just be a weight, something that we give more place to than God. Second thing I want you to think about is found in verse 26. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I mean, everything that Paul did, he had a purpose behind it. He had purpose. He purposed in everything. And that's, that's the thing I want you to think about is just being purposeful in everything that you do. Thinking about how does this affect my relationship with the Lord? How will this help me to grow closer to the Lord? And, and really, our race that we're in is all about getting closer to God. It's all about hearing God's voice cl more clearer than we ever have before. It's being able to sense the presence of God in our life and the direction that God's leading us. And even at times like Paul, 
where Paul wanted to go into Asia Minor, and the Holy Spirit forbade him. He wanted to go in there to, to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit said, no, not now. He didn't resist it. He didn't even think, well, it's the devil trying to keep me from doing God's will. No, he knew that, okay, it's God. God doesn't want me for right now for a reason, so I'll just keep moving on. And God used him somewhere else. Eventually, he did go back. I mean, even with that, I'm sure you're like me, and you want to know 100% without any doubt when God is leading you and guiding you. I never want to have a doubt what it is that God wants me to do. I never want to second guess either. The devil will never lead you or me to do anything that's good for God. But he will always tempt us to question the things of God and to go a different direction. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, look, at, look at verse 19 through 22. Verse 19, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Like I said, Paul had a purpose to everything he did. Nowhere in there is he saying, well, you know what? To win, to win the lawless, I became lawless. No, he's saying that he never lifted himself above anybody. There's another place where he said that he came to some people not knowing anything but Christ. And he was a well-educated man. He was, a, he was a religious man. He was a Pharisee. I mean, he had wealth. He talks about that. But he said, again, he said, no, I count all of that. But my goal in life is not to be superior over anybody, but to be on their level to help them rise up, to help them, number one, come to know my Savior, but number two, if it's a brother or sister in Christ, to help them rise up in their race, to help them be encouraged, and not to give up and not to quit. So having that purpose that, you know what, I do want to be used by God. I want God to give me victory in my life. I want God to do great things so that he's glorified and Christ is lifted up. The third thing I want you to think about is found in verse 27. 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul continues on and says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. Paul talks about just having control. Having control in all things. Again, everything I think is okay is not necessarily okay with God. Again, it may not be anything that's sinful. It may not be anything that's wicked. It may not be necessarily anything that God says, hey, don't do that. But at the same time, God may say, you know what, I don't want you doing that. Because God knows that maybe I'll start to give more place to that in my life instead of my walk with him. But Paul was controlled because he had a purpose. His purpose, again, was to win Christ, to get closer to the Lord, to have Jesus Christ magnified in his life. And honestly, that should be our desire as well, that you know what? Not only am I in the family of God, there's a race that God wants me to run, and he wants me to run this race with him so that he can help me win the race, so that I will win that prize, that prize of getting closer to him, that prize of him being magnified in my life so I have the mind of Christ, so I can make sound decisions and not be led astray, having the wisdom of God, so that I will have faith that's unwavering and unshakable, of faith that is strong in my Savior. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we close. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. You know, while Paul was running his race, and he called it a race, 
not that he was really competing. It's not about competing with other Christians. But as, but as Paul saw the races in his day that they would run, and he saw the athletes that would discipline themselves and they would work hard and they would get in those races and run those races to win that corruptible crown that they thought, you know, if I, this, if I, if I win this crown, I'll have status with everybody. I'll be known as the winner. I'll be revered by everybody. And Paul, you know, I believe, I mean, as Paul just sat and, and kind of thought about that as he went to Athens and saw that they had that inscription uh, to the unknown God, and he preached to them the unknown God on Mars Hill because he saw their superstition, he saw the things that they were worshiping, and, and they had this, again, this inscription uh, on, this, on this monument that said to the unknown God, just in case, you know, there was some God that they were missing that they wanted to worship, and he preached to them Jesus Christ. And that was Paul's race. He, his race was to lift others up, to point others to Christ. And Paul finished his race. And Paul wanted to encourage Timothy along the way. And, and Paul writes two letters to Timothy, a young man in the faith, a young man that he influenced along the way, who, uh, who was already a believer when, when Paul met him, because his mother and his grandmother uh, taught him the scriptures taught him the things of God, and Paul, Paul recognizes that. He even, he even says it in one of his letters to Timothy. But he wants Timothy to be encouraged as Paul comes to the end of his race. Paul knows his time is short. You know, he doesn't have much longer. He's writing from a, a Roman prison. He, know that, he knows that his day is coming. Well, he'll be executed, but he'll, more importantly, see the Lord face to face. He wanted to encourage Timothy, and he says in verse 6 of chapter 4, For I am now ready to be offered. He's speaking about his death, his execution. For, now, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's the most important thing of finishing our course is keeping the faith. Not just the faith that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, but the faith that, you know what? God is helping me all along the way. I am leaning upon those everlasting arms. I'm trusting in the eternal one. I'm trusting in the one that knows my name and knows everything about me from beginning to end and has helped me all along the way, helping me to finish my race. Because we can't finish it on our own. We need that encouragement. We need the strength, the grace of God to come alongside and help us. And he goes on to say, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That love his appearing. He's going to appear. The trumpet's going to sound and we will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord, to be with him. Then we'll be, then there'll be the judgment seat of Christ. It'll be the judgment seat of Christ where we stand before the Lord and we receive rewards based on the race that we've run, based on the, the life that we've lived for the Lord. Again, not for salvation, but the fact to stand before the judge, Jesus Christ knowing that he already knows our life. He knows the mistakes that we've made. He, he, he knows the times we've fallen down, and he knows those times that we've gotten back up and we just have kept running and kept going forward in the race that he has sent before us. You know what? That's what helps us to finish the race is our faith, our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith that, you know what? There is something he wants to do in our life, and that is to magnify himself so that we can finish the race. So we can finish having faith that, you know what, he's always here for me. He's always here to help me. There's a purpose to what I'm doing, and that purpose is Jesus Christ. 
There's a purpose why I keep running this race, even though at times I feel like giving up, because I look ahead at Jesus Christ, who's the author and finisher of my faith, and he cheers me on, just as he cheers you on. And that encourages us to keep moving because you know what? Not only is, can we look ahead at him, but he's right there with us helping us. But you and I have to discipline ourselves that, you know what? I'm going to trust the master. I'm going to trust, if I can call him my coach, as he tells me what to do. Because he's been this way before. He knows what it's like. He doesn't want us to get off track focusing on things that really are not important. The things that will just hinder us from getting closer to him. And he desires to help us in this matter and in this endeavor. He doesn't want, he doesn't want the devil to get the upper hand in our life. He doesn't want us to give up and to give in. But there may be that we have to throw our hands up and say, Lord, here am I. I give up on myself, and I totally put myself in your hands so that you can accomplish what you want to do in my life. Go ahead and stand if you would, and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you, Father, for just the, the fact, Lord, that you are involved in our life. We have an enemy who always wants to get us off track. But Lord, I thank you that you're always there to get us back on track. You're always there to encourage us, to give us the strength we need, to even help our faith to be stronger, to help our focus to be on you, and to give us that encouragement. I thank you, Lord, that we don't abide under the wrath of God, but under the grace of God. Again, Father, as your children, you deal gently with us, Lord. You lead us along life's path, showing yourself great, being the greatest friend that we can ever have had and filling us with your your peace filling us Lord with your grace the strength just to keep trusting you to keep looking at you to keep moving forward knowing that if God be for me who can be against me as the piano begins to play give you a few moments alone in prayer